gentlemen to Gary Melcher's home and studio. I am Joanna Patron. I am the curator. And today I'd like to talk to you about a particular facet of Gary Melcher's body of work, his memorable faces, and what makes them so. All artists, Gary Melcher's included, observe the world around them with a heightened perception. One in which uh, one's vision or perception is all, also highly personal, as unique as one's fingerprint. I am often called upon to authenticate works that have been attributed to Gary Melcher. And after three, four years, I'm starting to get pretty good at it. <laughs> uh, when I'm examining a work of art, the first thing I might look at, for instance, is the signature. Uh, how good is it? I might look at the subject. Is it representative of the artist's body and work? I might like look at the brushwork technique to see if it's characteristic of the artist's work. I would like to think that the, the figures, the people that he painted, are all very distinctive in one way, but that ain't the case, <laughs> unfortunately. Because his style shifted, from one thing to the next, different technique throughout his career. But there is something about his faces, uh, a quality that, that really distinguishes his art. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Let's look, for example, okay, I'll do this. There we go. Let's look at a high society portrait by one of Melcher's colleagues, John Singer Sargent. You might say, at least in this instance, that Sargent viewed his subjects from behind rose-colored glasses in a painting that depicts with broad and graceful brushstrokes an idealized, if not an, an, an idle uh, or privileged world free of worries and cares, while Gary Melcher's <coughs> lens was truer and clearer. The words of the dictum that he posted on a sign over his door at his studio, Varen Klar, true and clear. It was not Gary Melcher's <coughs> goal to capture a precise likeness, though he was obviously certainly capable of it. No, he moved beyond surface appearance. He was not a mere copier, but rather a sort of poetic interpreter. Now, I have to say right off that the bread and butter work of his career was portrait painting. This is a portrait of Helen Prowl. She was a Detroiter, painted in 1884. The painting is still owned by the Detroit Institute. It was executed in the style of fluid, easy elegance that was a typified international style of the day, established by artists like Whistler and Sargent. So early on, Melchers established himself as a painter of good likenesses, which of course is the first consideration of a formal portrait commission. But the best portraits aim for a penetrating analogy, um, subtly and sensitively revealing the transient thoughts or, or the fleeting emotions of the subject. And also making for the bigger picture, if you'll excuse the pun, uh, for an overall true characterization of the subject. It's easy to read Helen here. She obviously is a young, well-bred, demure woman. She has flowers in her gloved hands, which are uh, connote her present status as a single woman or an innocent. And the painting was probably produced on the occasion of her debut into society. But what if there is little in the sitter to inspire the artist? It wasn't uh, in Melcher's artistic makeup to be false or to be a flatterer. And it seems that the more portrait commissions that he accepted, the more he grew dissatisfied with them, and it sometimes reflected in his portrait paintings. This is certainly one of his finest portrait paintings not to be repeated too often, and it's very early in his career, 1884. So he's 24 years old. Happily, the most memorable faces Melcher's painted 
were the subjects that he discovered for himself, mostly in the format of anonymous portraits and scenes of everyday life. Anyone who is familiar with Gary Melcher's knows his most enduring quality is a robust and earthy sincerity of expression, truthful observation as opposed to artifice. Critics, for example, found Melcher's to be so insightful in his characterization of a Dutch with whom he had lived for many years that they mistook him for a native Dutchman. One biographer was so impressed by the authentic portrayal of his fishermen in this painting, the pilots, that he declared, you can sniff the sea in it. Looking at the weathered faces in these old salts, we realized that Melchers was uh, someone who sought out unconventional or uncommon beauty in unconventional models. And it can be successfully argued that beauty in a work of art rests not necessarily in the subject, but more so in the expression of the artist and how deeply he's moved to probe it. If Melchers can be accused of being a copier in his mapping of the human face, it was only to get at the life behind it, in much the same way as the ancient Romans, who discovered the aesthetic and psychological force of the real versus the Greek ideal. Melchers, too, seems to have been attracted to faces that communicated an authentic humanity to give us more than just a type, such as with this painting, a Dutchman with Pipe, in which uh, one of his favorite models, Albert Biker, posed. And here is a photograph of Albert much later in life. Biker possessed a strongly individualized face an attitude that Melchers was able, able to capture vividly here and in other pictures, bearing out the reference that Mrs. Melchers penned to her mother in 1904 when she wrote to her telling her that Gary had just sent a splendid study of Viker to a Berlin show. Uh, an image of him, quote, with that wonderful, dumb, inquiring, comical expression he wears whenever he is telling you yarns and ask for your approval. And here's another image of Edgar in a study for the Last Supper. He's posing as one of the apostles. You can't miss him. He's got such a distinctive look. Melchers was moved to record memorable faces when he remarked to a photographer, they lingered in his mind like music. The faces he immortalized convey such a force of personality that they can be classified as both anonymous scenes of everyday life and as faithfully rendered portraits. And it's in images of the working class with which Melchers was a most incisive and sympathetic chronicler. The painting of rustic life wasn't exactly Melchers' own invention. Uh, artists have been recording men at their labors for 2,000 years. It was in the classroom of Europe that Melchers cut his teeth on the old masters, particularly Northern European art, on uh, the influence of Franz Hals, his humanism, and on the gravitas of Rembrandt. And these are three self-portraits of Rembrandt. Portraiture was to Rembrandt a great challenge of revelation, and it's a tradition that helped inform Melcher's most representative works, coupled with the current rage for naturalism. Naturalism is a late 19th century art movement centered on images of provincial life. Its followers reproduce the representative attitudes, settings, traditions uh, of a region to portray their subjects as they really were. Worse than all, uh, a, a, a practice that earned these artists the moniker Apostles of Ugliness. It was the work of the Hay School painters, sometimes called the Gray painters, that Melchers encountered in Holland. Um, the French practitioners of naturalism, led by uh, Jules Bastien Lepage in Paris, and the followers of Wilhelm Leibel, uh, the naturalist painter in Germany, um, I think that really had a direct influence on the American artist's fondness for working class subjects. The emergence of naturalism across
across the arts, even in music and in literature, springs from rapidly changing cultural forces. The agrarian culture of the past was no longer the norm. The Industrial Revolution had changed that, and it resulted in a strain of anti-modernism among certain artists. Even photographers began to seek out old world types as worthwhile subjects, feeding into the public's nostalgia for the pre-moderns. This is a photograph by Frank Sutcliffe, a contemporary of Melcher's, and a founder of the naturalist movement in photography. He produced an enduring record of village life in the seaside village of Whitby, England, and his photographs are hard to come by, very collectible. So peasant painting became commercially lucrative, and Melcher set up to record it uh, in the hinterlands of North Holland, a place uh, as yet untouched by modernity. To live and paint among the natives as they really were, primitive types, not the cosmopolitan Parisians and Londoners that come to mind when we think of the Gilded Age. Melcher's picture spoke with clarity of the working class experience a life that revolved around work, worship, and the family without resorting to stereotypes, although admittedly sometimes Melchers occasionally gave into sentimentality. <clears throat> Many Americans turned in the same direction, at least for a time, to paint the same rustic types as Melchers, Frank Duvenek in his Wilt Whistling Boy, the early William Merritt Chase in his Long Island Fisherman, and the next uh, generation, Robert Henry and the man of Segovia. And um, also they employed in their, their painting the same coarse textured brushwork technique as did Melchers. It seems to suit the humble quality or the humble subject. It's in these images that I was reminded of the memorable working class faces recorded by Melchers, like those seen in the Smithy. Um, current loan that we're enjoying here at Belmont and the painting which really inspired today's talk. It was painted at the height of Melcher's career around 1889. It is an important canvas because it bears all the hallmarks of a classic Melcher's, a fondness for working class types, descriptive realism, and anecdotal detail. The faces that confront us here is uh, are possess such a, a spark of life and familiarity that we can easily engage mentally and emotionally. You can read these faces like books. Jan Carols, the name of this man, was a favorite Dutch model of Melcher's and he posed front and center as a metalsmith in the ubiquitous Dutch trade of brass and copper. He is a formidable figure, and Melchers underscores his physicality by giving him a ruddy complexion burnished by the heat of the forge. An unwavering gaze that hints of a strong will and a, and a powerfully sized hands restrained against the lap of his leather apron. I think his rounded shoulders might even connote the toll of life's labor, and a slightly gaping mouth implies a certain vacuousness which some reviewers went as far as to say the Smith really looked like a good-natured simpleton. <laughs> Compare the Smith to his young apprentice, perhaps Melcher's meant for us to read this as, as the Smith's son. Uh, he is, uh, he's got his whole life ahead of him. He's trim, he's upright, and he's engaged in his trade. And the milk-skinned girl to his other side, possibly Carol's real-life daughter, Peacha, uh, is strapping in carriage and proud as a peacock with that ridiculous hat, as one of uh, Melcher's observers remarked. Um, it, she's also the genuine article. And of course, the household's calico cat nestles up against the rotund Smith, providing an extra touch of domestic warmth. It's this direct uh, truthfulness of personality that gives these figures their humanity. These faces held Melcher's captive. They so resonated for him that he kept painting them, faithfully reproducing them, so that we recognize them elsewhere in other pictures. I think there's a good chance that the man who poses as the grandfatherly type of old and young is also young Carl's. And here is the girl in the smithy in that hat 
again. She wouldn't give up that hat. It was the girl with the hat. And I'm pretty convinced also it's the girl in the communicant, which is owned by the Detroit Institute. And it's always fun to discover the Smith's doppelganger or his double in, in everyday culture. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that George Kennedy and Al Carls were twins? <laughs> Or perhaps I'm thinking of, who is that? Charles, Charles Lawton, <laughs> right. The setting for the, the family portrait is the Smith's workshop. It's requisite forge or smithy is somewhere back here, just out of view to the right. And the tools of the Smith's trade are at his elbow and along the back wall. Melcher's predilection for staged, multi-figural compositions and narrative detail was a hangover, really, from the mid-19th century. And it's this aspect of his art that usually differentiates him from other American painters of rustic naturalism. We see this narrative aspect, again, in other pictures, like the sermon, which is owned by the Smithsonian. Unmistakably, there's a storyline here in the sermon. The picture's action centers around that sharp-faced matron who studies the sleeping girl in the middle of the service who can't relate to that kind of episode. Some of you are probably asleep right now. <laughs> Melcher's proclivity towards narrative is one of the qualities that audiences find endearing. This and pictures like The Family, owned by the National Gallery in Berlin, possess the strong narrative element that reminds a lot of art visitors of the illustrator Norman Rockwell. And it was this strong anecdotal aspect that would, by 1900, cause Melcher to be condemned by some critics as being old-fashioned, and they probably had a valid point. But happily, there is an earnest and humane tenor to Melcher's pictures that still strikes a chord with many of our audiences, like the choir master and his young choristers here at Belmont. The plain fact is Melcher liked his subjects, many of whom were his neighbors, and he admired them for their work ethic, their devotion to family, and their simple godly ways. Nothing burned in him more than to bring them to life. There isn't anything particularly remarkable about these scenes, um, but it's their sense of actuality that impressed then and still impresses today. As reviewers repeated over and over how alive they are, critics never tired of dismiss these power to engage the viewer. As one critic wrote, all are figures which he has reproduced with an honesty and force which gives them an intense feeling of vitality, and that really applies to so much of Melcher's body of work. And I also want to add that it was a common convention of the naturalist painters, like Lyle here on the left with his ill-matched couple, and Bastien Lepage on the right with the communicant, to position their subjects as if they're sitting before the camera to replicate the documentary look of this new technology in a sort of painting that imitates photography that imitates life. A pictorial advice that, a device that Melcher's employed in countless uh, examples, including the smithy. And it was in this format that it was really critical that the faces were strong enough to carry the picture. And they were for Melcher's too. Here are Melcher's counterparts. Uh, Saller and Sweetheart, which is at the Freer Gallery in Washington, and again, his communicant from Detroit, longtime favorites. Melcher sometimes deliberately eliminate, eliminated distractions in order to focus on the emotive expression of his subjects, examples being the intimidating fencing master from Detroit, a variation of Belmont's fencer, and the almost poignant embroiderer which is owned, oh, I can't remember the name, Crystal Bridges. It's owned by Crystal Bridges in Arkansas, bought by Sam Walton's daughter. Admittedly, the last two are not uh, working class subjects, but does it really matter? We don't need to know their identities. Um, the titles certainly don't give that away. Like the peasant pictures, everything we need to know here, Melchers provides in paint, if we but look. For with the most gifted portrait painters, there is nothing hidden that cannot be revealed. Just as Dorian Gray. Mm -hmm. This is even more emphatic 
in pictures like St. Jean Vienne, the patron saint of Paris, where Melcher zoomed in like a camera to heighten the psychological impact. Melcher St. Jean Vienne, who just might be the same model as in the Smithy, reads like a devotional image out of the medieval era. The halo, the fixed eyes, the parted lips, their visual <coughs> metaphors for transcendence. And the use of a, a simple peasant girl is in keeping with the day's notion that the most godly are those who live closest to the soil. The same can be said about the Art Institute of Chicago's Mother and Child, which is rarely on view in Chicago. And so we brought it uh, to Gary Melcher's home studio a number of years ago. And over and over, our visitors claimed they had seen it before. Oh, yes, we know it. It's very famous. Not really. It's not well known. It's not famous. But they were probably confusing it with the timeless figures that emerge out of the shadows of a Da Vinci or a Rembrandt. It does have a very classical look to it. The model is so wholesome so fiercely protective that she becomes a metaphorical tree of life to the fruit she is born. She's a universal symbol of motherhood, a Madonna of the people. And the model certainly was not idealized by the painter. The painting is a dead ringer for the real Anna Decker, who was a favorite model for Gary when he sat down to paint the mother and child theme. So while it's a very good likeness, very accurate, uh, here, Decker becomes a timeless archetype that we're not likely to forget. Again, so potent is the image he painted of her that it was used on a stamp in 1975 in Rwanda, and also as the cover of a just released novel about an unwed mother and her efforts to keep her child. How apt an image, a picture, a well-painted face can indeed tell a thousand words. No wonder they use it for the cover of this book. While it's true that what is most striking about Gary Melcher's art is its wide breadth, he was equally at ease painting interiors, landscapes, the still life, the nude. What springs to mind first today at the mention of Melcher's name are, the char are his characteristic scenes of everyday whose faces unfailingly linger on the mind like music. And it's those faces, more than anything else, that solidified Melcher's reputation as an American master. Are there any questions? We're, the, the gallery doors are open. You're welcome to step into the gallery now and take a look at the smithy, our signature painting and works that are related to it. Yes, sir. Is there any evidence regarding what Melchers had in mind with the title, The Smithy? Do you know if he was referring to the person or the place? That's a good question. We debated it a little bit ourselves because the Smithy is indeed a forge and it also is another term for a smith or a blacksmith, but a blacksmith is one type of smith. So we really don't know because we have the whole picture. We have the smith and his company in the smithy. So it's really hard to tell. Nothing in the literature. No. Any no. no. Uh, but didn't you mention it was another name for the painting one time? Well, we don't know if it was Melcher's name uh, because a lot of times critics, when they wrote in their reviews, they weren't careful or they mis misremembered names. And also, sometimes the people who were printing um, leaflets for, for shows got names wrong. They couldn't remember the name. They didn't write it down, so they just came up with a name. It has been called twice, early on, when it was exhibited in Germany, the village tinker. Thank you for reminding me. Tinker makes sense. A tinker is somebody who's going to work on a small scale, like a metalsmith working in copper and brass, whereas a blacksmith wouldn't be called a tinker. So perhaps. Melchers was thinking in terms of the smithy, the man, because it's certainly the most prominent focus of the whole work is the personality of this man. Any other questions? Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.